Right, so we're going to go through the depth in chemistry OCR paper. Again, this is this is the one that's openly available on the internet, um, so it's not a controlled paper. But we're just going to go through some bits to point out. So, uh, there's no multiple choice in this paper. Uh, it's all a longer answer questions. So let's kick off. Um, and it wants me uh, to, first of all, write an equation for the reaction of um, bromine with phosphorus. So the key thing to remember, uh, it told me phosphorus is P4, so that's good. Bromine is, of course, a diatomic molecule, so it goes around in pairs. It's given me... Um, the formula of phosphorus tribromide, which is rather lovely of it. Um, I've got four phosphorus there, which means I need four there. So I have got a total of 12 bromines there, which means I need six Br2 there. Right, so how many molecules are there in uh, 1.335 grams of phosphorus tribromide? Um, okay, so, the relative molecular mass of phosphorus tribromide is 270.7. So to find the number of molecules, I need to first of all find the number of moles and then times it by Avogadro's number. So uh, moles is going to equal 1.3535 divided by 270.7. That comes to... 5.000 times 10 to the minus 3 moles. And then remember, uh, we times that number by Avogadro's number. So the number of molecules is equal to 5.000 times 10 to the minus 3 times by Avogadro's number, which is on your data sheet as being 6.02 times 10 to the 23, and you get a whopping number of 3.01 times 10 to the 21. It's always going to be a big number because it's the number of molecules. If you're getting a tiny number, something's gone horribly wrong. It's got to be a big number. Uh, so this is a common question that comes up again. Uh, they've given me the dot and cross diagram of phosphorus tribromide, which is rather lovely of them. Uh, now they want me to um, name the shape and explain why it has that shape. So first of all, we're going to name the shape. It's going to be pyramidal. And why is it pyramidal? So the key things to always say, how many bonding pairs, how many non-bonding pairs, and then talk about pairs of electron repellents. Here we go. Three bonding pairs. Hopefully you can see that. One, two, three. One non-bonding pair. Pairs of electrons repel to get as far away as they can from each other. Lone pairs repel more than bonding pairs. So always go through that routine. Number of bonding pairs, number of non-bonding pairs. Then always say pairs of electrons repel to get as far away as they can from each other. Lone pairs repel more than bonding pairs. You'll be should be sorted. Uh, so give me some average bond entropies now. So it looks like we're heading into some entropy. Ooh, exciting times. Um, they give me the definition, rather lovely. Why do bromine and iodine not exist in the gaseous state under standard conditions? Well, what are standard conditions? Standard conditions is going to be room temperature. So at room temperature, there isn't enough energy to break the London forces between the molecules, um, effectively. So for bromine and iodine at room temperature, there isn't enough energy to break the London forces between the molecules. So it now wants me to calculate the entropy change formation of um, I, IDR. Okay, so here we go. What is the entropy of formation? The entropy formation is I take the elements in their standard states. to make one mole of IDR. I can't change that number, so that's got to be a half, and that's got to be a half. 
and then I need to add up the bonds broken minus the bonds made. So what have I broken? I have broken half an ID bond. So half times 151 plus half a brainy bond, which is 193. And if I do that, that comes to 172. I've made an IBR bond, which is 175. And then it's that number minus that number, which gives me minus three kilojoules per mole. So, ID monobromide is a polar molecule. A uh, heterolytic fission occurs to form an electrophile. So take the mean of an electrophile and the formula of the electrophile to form. Okay, so if you think about it, IBR, who is the most electronegative out of those two? Well, if you remember, um, electronegativity increases up group seven. Fluorine's the most electronegative. So, um, bromine's gonna be delta minus and ID delta plus. So when heterolytic bond fission goes, the electrons will go to the bromine to leave me with I plus, which is going to be my electrophile. Remember, if you're an electrophile, you love electrons, so you're going to be positive. Um, and what is an electrophile? Well, an electrophile is an electron pair acceptor. Bromine disproportionates when it reacts with potassium hydroxide solution. Suggest a reaction for this. Well, you have done a similar reaction with chlorine, of course. So you basically just substitute in uh, bromine for chlorine to give you potassium bromide. Uh, bromide yeah. uh, potassium bromate one plus water, like so. Right, let's power on to question two then. Uh, large proportion of the world's organic chemicals used to make addition polymers, which are very useful. Polypropene is shown below. Um, why is polypropene a saturated hydrocarbon? Well, if you have a look at it, it contains only single bonds. So it only has single bonds in it. What is the bond angle um, around each carbon in polypropene? Well, around each carbon, each carbon has got four bonds and therefore it must be tetrahedral and therefore your bond angle is 109.5. Uh, after polymers have been used for packaging, they need to be processed to save resources, e.g. by recycling. Two other ways in which waste polypropene can be processed in a sustainable way. Well, you can burn them for energy production. You can't just say burn them. You can burn them for energy production because that's being sustainable. You're getting something from it. The other thing that you can do is you can actually crack them so you can break them up again. If you remember from GCC, cracking a crude oil, take a big molecule, crack it into smaller molecules. You can do the same for polymers. You can crack them up and then you can use those smaller molecules as organic feedstock for other processes. So polyethanol is used to make soluble laundry bags. And there we go. Draw the structure to represent a repeat unit. Um, okay, so uh, if you have a look at it, that's my repeat unit, isn't it, going on? So um, I need to put a double bond between there, so it's going to be, oh no, they don't want the monomer, they just want a repeat unit. So uh, it's going to be that, CH, OH, and then do your lines like so, brackets, and then your little N, like so. Right, so it now wants me to analyse um, this compound. So polyethenol is unstable um, and forms a more stable structural isomer. Analysis gives the following data. Um, and it wants me to identify what have I got. 
Well, if you look at the IR spectrum, what do you notice? Well, there's two things to notice from this. The first one is this whopper of a band there, which is your C double bond O. So this one, C double bond O, because it falls between, just quote from your data sheet, 1640 to 1750 wave numbers. What else don't you notice? Well, you notice an absence of an OH group. There's no broad absorption here. Remember, this is CH. These are sharp. If it was OH, you see a broad uh, peak there. So the other thing to notice is there's no OH peak, uh, which uh, would appear between 3,200 and 3,600 wave numbers. So two things to know. So it looks like I've got a C double bond O in there. Let's have a look at the mass spectrum. What have I got here? Well, my mass spectrum, I've got a peak at 29 or so. So 29 coming in here. Uh, 29 could be CHO plus. I've also got a peak coming in at around about 15, which would be CH3 plus. Don't forget to put your plus signs on. Uh, because it's the ions that are being identified. So what's it like I've got? Remember I started with this. I need to find an isomer which has got a double bond on. Oh. So it looks to me like it's going to be that bad boy there. So um, it's ethanol that is actually the molecule that was in the spectrum.